and you, yeah, you can add your mask on. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for our stargazing lecture. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I'm a scientist here who will be your host for this evening's event. Thank you guys for all coming um, to Caltech and rejoining our in-person events. Um, just a quick layout of the schedule for tonight. After I finish my two minutes of uh, announcements, I'll introduce our speaker, speaker uh, Dr. Kyle Kramer, who's going to talk to us about um, black holes and white dwarfs and neutron stars and globular cluster environments. That'll last for about 30 minutes, and then we will take some questions from the audience and we'll also allow you guys, we're, we're setting up telescopes right now. Obviously it's still light outside, so we can't see anything except the sun and the blue sky when it's light outside, but um, sunset is right now. And so in 30 minutes or so, it should be dark enough for us to start seeing some of the cool stuff in the sky. So we'll have telescopes set up. There will be signs that'll lead you just to the fields directly behind this building. Um, and we'll have a couple of telescopes out there for to showcase various things that are visible in the sky right now. And at the exact same time as the telescopes will be set up, we'll be setting up a Q&A panel here, consisting of Kyle, myself, and two other scientists from the department who work on different fields to be able to answer, oh, to be able to answer questions on a variety of different topics. Um, so you, you know, if you have some question that's been keeping you up at night related to space science and astronomy and physics, uh, feel free to keep it in mind and ask us. We're also live streaming this on YouTube Live right now and Facebook Live. So uh, members of the online audience, um, if you have questions about uh, Dr. Kramer's presentation or about the JWST results or something like that, keep them in mind. We'll be monitoring what you guys say in the YouTube chat and the Facebook chat and be able to address those questions during the Q&A panel afterwards. And yeah, hopefully you guys enjoy it. We ha these events happen once a month on Friday nights. Our next one will be August 5th. Um, and we also have a sister series of events called Astronomy on Tap that takes place at, uh, at a bar in Old Town Pasadena one month or one night a month on Monday nights. It's currently being hosted at a bar called The Dog House. It's an all ages restaurant. It's all outdoors. So there's a patio area. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Yeah, technical difficulties. Yeah, the batteries went, just went out, but fortunately I had another nine volt here and now things are dropping in the audience. It's like the Muppet show here. Um, okay, so yeah, we have astronomy on, hap on tap that happens once a month at a bar in Old Town Pasadena called the Dog House. Our, what's going on back there, guys? Okay, water bottle. Okay, cool. Um, we had one this Monday. It was great. We'll have another one uh, Monday, August 15th. I haven't yet figured out who the speakers will be, but it's super fun. Two 15-minute informal talks given by different scientists about their research. And then there's pub trivia that's astronomy themed. And there's a live band. Jason Achilles plays, and it's really good. And we also bring a telescope out there. So that's free. I mean, the food and the beer isn't free, but the science is free. And, and you guys should definitely check it out. So. Um, we start those at 7.30 p.m. And it usually goes until 9.30, but like any event, you can come and go as you please, whatever works best for your schedule. So I think those are all the announcements that I have for right now. Um, our speaker for tonight is Dr. Kyle Kramer. Uh, Kyle joined the department just a year and a half ago, two years ago. He was previously, he did his PhD at Northwestern University, just north of Chicago and um, has been doing some amazing work with uh, some of the stuff he's gonna talk about, globular clusters, this really strange environment we, which we don't find very often. It's very crowded in space, whereas most of space is very empty. Um, and in fact, one of the targets that we're going to be able to see through the telescope back there is a very bright globular cluster. So there'll be some connection between what you can see through the telescope and what uh, Dr. Kramer is going to talk about tonight. So. Please welcome Dr. Kramer. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks again for coming tonight. As Cameron said, my name is Kyle. I am a uh, postdoc here at Caltech. 
And I am primarily a computational astrophysicist, which basically means that unlike astronomers who are observers, who use a telescope to look at various objects out in the sky, planets, stars, globular clusters, I build computer models of these systems. And the basic goal is to use the computer models to help explain the various things that we observe, especially the weird things that are uh, difficult to understand that we observe, uh, and also use the models to make predictions for things that we might observe in the future. Um, so there are many different types of things that I um, am interested in in astronomy and build models for. Uh, the specific type of system I'm going to talk about tonight um, is, you might say, sort of my specialty, which is these very dense stellar environments known as globular clusters. So as you can see from this picture, this is one of the globular clusters in the Milky Way in our own galaxy. These are really dense uh, densely packed populations of stars. A typical cluster has roughly a million stars, and they're gravitationally bound within a very small volume. So as Cameron hinted at in his intro, this makes these systems somewhat unique in astronomy because they are very dense and there are lots of interesting types of dynamical interactions that can operate in these systems that are specific to the fact that they are so dense. And as I'll talk about over the next 30 minutes or so, the life of a star or a black hole or a neutron star within one of these globular clusters is very different from what it might experience if it was in just a normal uh, galactic field environment. Okay, so first, uh, let's sort of just sort of give a basic idea of what a globular cluster is. So globular clusters have a few very defining characteristics. They are generally very old populations of stars, so 10 billion years old or older, some of the oldest structures in the universe, actually. So this is really interesting, especially for the globular clusters in the Milky Way, because they're so old, they um, can be used to trace the formation of our own galaxy. These are really great archeological tools for probing the history of our galaxy and how our galaxy formed. Um, as I said before, um, globular clusters generally contain roughly a million stars, and they're also very compact. So the typical size of a globular cluster is roughly a parsec in scale. So to give you an idea of a parsec, um, the closest star to our sun, Proxima Centauri, is also about a parsec away, just a little bit over one parsec. So this tells you right away how unbelievably dense these environments are. The closest star to our sun is about a parsec away. That means within that parsec, there are basically two stars, our sun and Proxima Centauri. But within one of these globular clusters, within this roughly parsec size, you're packing roughly a million stars within this volume. So these environments are many thousands of times denser, even up to millions of times denser than the environment in which our sun lives in the typical field of the Milky Way galaxy. So right away, you can see how extremely exotic these types of systems are compared to maybe what we're used to. So to give you another idea of how dense these systems are, this is what um, the night sky might look like from the Earth if the Earth was living in the middle of a globular cluster. So you can see right away there are way more stars visible in the night sky than we currently see. The night sky would be roughly 20 times brighter in a globular cluster than it is um, on a night sky for a full moon here on Earth. So this might seem like it's really exciting from an astronomy perspective. There's all these stars we could observe. It would actually be a nightmare for astronomers because the night sky would be so bright, we wouldn't be able to observe things as nearly as well with our telescopes, just because there's so much background light. We could observe all these individual stars very well, but if we wanted to look at, for example, a distant galaxy, it would be very challenging because of how bright the night sky would be. But luckily we don't live in a globular cluster. And actually there are many reasons why we're lucky as I'll hint at later in the talk. So uh, this is sort of a zoom out picture. This is a side on view of um, an illustration of the Milky Way showing the location of these globular clusters within our own galaxy. So in the Milky Way, there are roughly 150 of these globular clusters that are observed. We think there's maybe another 50 or so that we just can't observe because they're hidden behind the uh, galactic center. So there's maybe about 200 clusters in the Milky Way. As you can see, they're generally distributed roughly spherically out in the halo of the galaxy. And there's also some clusters that are living in the disk where the sun and uh, we live. So um, the Milky Way has about 100 to 200 globular clusters. We now observe globular clusters in essentially all types of galaxies. Even the smallest dwarf galaxies have a handful of globular clusters. And then massive elliptical galaxies like M87, which is in the Virgo cluster of galaxies, has tens of thousands of globular clusters. So these are very common types of environments and seem to be a common feature of all galaxy types. 
Okay, so let's zoom in on the type of stars that are living in a cluster and let's sort of look a little bit in more detail at what type of things a star in a cluster might experience. So the sun, of course, is um, isolated. It's a single star. It doesn't have any companions. It has planets, but it's on its own as far as a star being a star is concerned. There are also many stars that are in binary systems. Roughly half of the stars in the galaxy are actually, we expect, in binaries. They have a bound companion orbiting uh, like you see in the middle animation here. So single stars like the sun, of course, are very tame. They're not undergoing interactions with other stars. Even a binary star, generally speaking, it's a pretty mild um, experience these stars are living through. Sometimes the binary stars might get close enough to start interacting with each other, but most binary stars are on fairly wide orbits like in this picture, and they're basically just orbiting each other very gently and not really perturbing one another that significantly. But in star clusters, as a result of the very high densities, because you're packing these stars so closely together, groups of stars frequently undergo near close interaction with one another. And this is an example of what happens when a binary star comes into contact, dynamical contact with a single star. You can see they start undergoing these chaotic interactions within the, within the cluster that are completely different than the types of uh, interactions that our sun or even typical binary stars might experience. So then if we zoom out again and look at the cluster as a whole, and this is an example of a computer simulation of a globular cluster like the type that I typically work on, we can press play and we can see what the cluster as a whole looks like. So right away, just by sort of looking at this animation um, in bulk, you can see right away there are, it's completely chaotic. There's all sorts of interactions happening constantly. The orbits of stars are being constantly perturbed. And another really fun exercise is to look at just a single star, pick any one you want, and trace the orbit of the star um, within the simulation. And you can see the orbits of stars often come close enough to other stars in the cluster that basically in these interactions change their orbit completely. So the idea is that the cumulative effect of these many close flyby encounters that are happening in a dense environment like a globular cluster um, essentially give the system its roughly spherical shape. These constant interactions are changing the orbits and this is basically what gives these objects their name, globular clusters, named after this sort of characteristic uh, spherical configuration. Okay, so um, one other thing you may have noticed in this animation is that there's occasionally these very big stars that appear and then disappear. So this has to do with the evolution of stars, and the evolution of stars is key for the next uh, part of this talk, which is compact objects. So the next thing I'm going to do is take a quick diversion and talk a little bit about stellar evolution and talk about the different types of compact objects that can form as a byproduct of stellar evolution. So the next thing we'll do after this is basically take what we've learned about compact objects, put them back in the globular cluster, and talk about something really cool, which is what happens when you have a bunch of black holes living in one of these really dense environments. Okay, so... Um, first, let's talk about the sun, what a star like the sun might do while it evolves. So um, as stars evolve, basically the, the main, um, the key ingredient is basically establishing an equilibrium between gravity, which compresses the star, the matter, and pulls everything inward, and the inward pressure generated by the energy that comes from nuclear fusion of hydrogen in the core. So basically, um, as long as you're able to burn hydrogen in the core, stars can reach an equilibrium where they're able to live um, roughly a uh, constant life throughout, their, um, throughout the majority of their lives. But eventually you run out of fuel in the core, you run out of hydrogen to burn. And at this point, I'll start this animation over, the star starts to expand. Um, and it starts to expand basically as a way to try to um, come back, whoops, too far. The star starts to expand in a way to try to settle back into a new equilibrium based on the fact that there's no longer burning of hydrogen going on in the core. So the outer layers start to expand and eventually the outer layers are shedded. The star loses outer layers and the inner part of the core, the core collapses into a compact object. So in the case of a star like the sun, the core collapses into what's known as a white dwarf and more massive stars collapse into different types of objects. So let's now look at an animation of a more massive star, something like a star 10 to 100 times the mass of our sun. So in this case, you can reach sufficiently high temperatures in the core to burn even heavier elements, helium, carbon, oxygen, et cetera. 
And basically what happens is the core reaches significantly um, high enough temperatures to um, attain a configuration that is able to undergo a supernova explosion, which basically violently sheds its outer layers out into space. And in this case, then the core collapses into an even denser compact object, which would be either a neutron star or in the case of the most massive black holes, like I showed in this animation, a black hole. So it's hard to see in this animation because it's black, but there's a black hole at the center there. Okay, so there are basically there's three types of compact objects that we expect to form as the byproducts of stellar evolution, the end states of the evolution of typical stars. So as I said, the evolution of stars like our sun, which is the majority of stars in the universe, our sun is pretty common, lead to a white dwarf. So a white dwarf has roughly the mass of the sun, maybe a little bit less, and it's compressed down to the size of roughly the earth. So these are very dense objects, much denser than a typical star, much denser than our sun. Next, you have neutron stars. So neutron stars form from stars roughly 10 times the mass of the sun. And these are even more compact objects. So the typical radius of a neutron star is around 10 kilometers or roughly the size of a city. So here I'm showing a neutron star compared to the skyline of Chicago, which is where I did my PhD. So these are incredibly dense objects compared to even white dwarfs. And then of course, last we have the black holes, which are formed from the most massive stars. These are stars that are um, dozens to even hundreds of times as massive as our sun. And as you can see from this image, black holes have this, uh, this characteristic um, black sphere, which is called the event horizon, which basically defines, is defined as the distance at which, the radius at which um, the gravitational pull of the black hole is so strong that light can't escape. And this, of course, is what gives black holes their name. They're black because they're so dense that nothing, including light, can escape their gravitational pull. So the typical size of this event horizon is actually similar to a neutron star. It's about 10 kilometers for a typical um, stellar mass black hole. But of course, within that event horizon, the matter gets crunched to even higher densities. And your guess is as good as mine what the details are within the event horizon, because by definition, we can't look inside. Okay, so this is the landscape. These are the different types of compact objects we can expect that to form. These compact objects um, form in a galaxy. There are many of these types of systems observed in the Milky Way in different contexts. And in any other stellar population, globular clusters included, we expect these compact objects are going to be forming. So the next thing I wanna do is return to our basic picture of a globular cluster and talk about the compact objects that might form and what types of experiences these compact objects might undergo as they evolve within their host cluster. So let's start with our cluster with roughly a million stars at birth. And at the beginning, everything is just a star. There are no compact objects left. The most massive stars evolve the quickest and the most massive stars very quickly form black holes within the first few million years of the evolution of the cluster. So for a typical cluster with about a million stars, you can expect to form roughly a thousand black holes. There should be roughly a thousand stars that are sufficiently massive to end up forming a black hole. So once these black holes form, these are very massive compared to the other stars in the cluster at this point. So similar to uh, if you took a bunch of pebbles and you dropped them in a pond, they're all gonna sink to the bottom. It's not exactly the same reasons, but this gives you an idea. Black holes, as a result of the gravitational interactions within one of these systems, once they form, they sink to the center of the cluster. And this happens very quickly within maybe tens or hundreds of millions of years after they form. So once you form your black holes, they sink and they form this very dense subsystem, subcluster of black holes in the center. And clusters themselves are very dense in the center, but these black hole subsystems specifically are even denser. They're up to millions of times denser than even the typical cluster itself. So then on slightly longer timescales, the next most massive population of stars forms the neutron stars. So neutron stars are kind of special because and I'm not gonna go into details of this, but we expect based on observations of neutron stars in the Milky Way that neutron stars receive large kicks when they're born as a result of asymmetries in the supernova explosion. So it's actually expected that these kicks at birth are sufficient to eject a lot of the neutron stars that are formed in a cluster. 
So we, uh, um, we expect that most of the neutron stars formed are actually going to be kicked out of the cluster and only maybe a few hundred neutron stars are actually retained at later times. So you have maybe a thousand stellar mass black holes and maybe a few hundred neutron stars. Now, neutron stars are pretty much roughly similar in mass to the sun, maybe a little bit more massive, similar in mass to the other stars in the cluster. So they don't sink like the black holes. They hang out in the outer parts of the cluster with most of the other normal luminous stars and they don't form this dense system like the black holes do. And then on longer time scales, the least massive stars, so these are stars like the sun, will form white dwarfs. And as I said before, white dwarfs are the most common end product of stellar evolution. So at the end of the day, at the end of the cluster's evolution, these are by far the most abundant type of compact object. A typical cluster is expected to have tens of thousands of white dwarfs at the end. Like the neutron stars, the white dwarfs are pretty low mass, in some cases even lower mass than the typical star in the cluster. So the white dwarfs also hang out in the outer parts of the cluster. They don't sink like the black holes do. So this is basically the, tip, the type of uh, structure we can expect most globular clusters look like throughout the majority of their lives. You have most of the luminous normal stars living out in the outer parts of the cluster. The black holes have sunk to the bottom and they form this very dense subsystem of black holes. So the next thing I'm going to do, I want to play an animation of what happens if you look inside at the black holes within one of these clusters, in one of these dense black hole cores. So it's a little bit hard to see, but you can kind of see these little uh, points, which are the black holes, of course. And um, as you stare at this animation, I want to sort of point you to three key things. So the first is occasionally you'll see a star come really close to a black hole and then get flung out at a really high velocity. So this is a result of basically black holes being really massive. When a star comes close to a black hole or when anything comes close to a black hole for that matter, it essentially gets uh, slingshotted out at a higher velocity. So you can see these stars being flung out and a lot of the stars actually are kicked with a high enough velocity to be ejected from the cluster entirely. Another thing you'll see is occasionally the black holes also get flung out with really high velocities. This is because the black holes not only interact with stars but they interact with other black holes. So as a result of these black hole, black hole encounters, we expect that the total population of black holes within one of these clusters actually decreases over time because the black holes essentially kick each other out of the cluster through their gravitational interactions. And then the last thing I want to point out is occasionally you'll see a pair of black holes come close enough to form a bound pair, a bound binary. And these are really interesting because we expect that eventually the ultimate fate of these binaries is a merger of the pair of black holes. And it, once the animation plays a little longer, we're going to zoom in on an individual black hole binary right here. And essentially, we expect one of the byproducts, again, of these very dense black hole cores is for the black holes to form binaries and eventually merge with each other. So we expect black holes are really efficient factories of black hole binary mergers, which is kind of cool when you think about it, that within the centers of these clusters, like the one we're going to look at tonight, there are very likely large populations of hidden black holes that are merging together. So you might ask, okay, black holes are black, they don't emit light, how can we observe this? Or maybe I'm just making all this up and I ran some crazy computer simulations. Well, there's actually really good evidence observationally for the presence of black holes in clusters. So there's a few ways we can potentially observe these. So one is if the black hole is in a binary companion with a luminous star. So as I showed in the previous visualization, the black holes very frequently interact with stars and occasionally form binary pairs. Although you can't observe the black hole itself, you can observe its binary companion. And by measuring the orbit, something called the radial velocity of the orbit of the companion star, we can infer the presence and infer the mass of that hidden companion, of its black hole companion. So actually uh, about four years ago in 2018, the first black hole um, uh, to be formed through uh, the evolution of a star, a stellar mass black hole, was detected in a globular cluster in the Milky Way. This was NGC 3201, just a random normal cluster, not so different from the one we're gonna be looking at tonight. Um, and a black hole was detected in this cluster. And then later on, um, the observing team actually found two additional black holes in this cluster, all through this, um, this binary detection method where they're observing the orbit of its companion star. So then what about black hole plus black hole binaries, the ones that merge in, uh, like I was showing in the previous visual. So as of about six years ago, we also can observe black hole, black hole binaries. And these can be observed through the detection of gravitational waves. 
So gravitational waves are basically ripples in space and time that are caused by uh, the acceleration of really massive objects. And as it turns out, the in spiral of pairs of black holes, black hole binaries, like the ones formed in globular clusters, emit really loud gravitational wave signals that can be detected here on Earth. So um, in 2015, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, otherwise known as LIGO, uh, detected for the first time the, the gravitational wave signal from the merger of a pair of black holes. And this was a really exciting event. This, these gravitational waves were first predicted by Einstein about 100 years ago. Um, in fact, almost 100 years to the date that they were detected, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's been a long time coming, this proposed idea of detecting these. And when they finally detected these about six years ago, seven years ago, it's uh, completely changed the way that we observe the universe. And in my opinion, this is one of the most exciting, rapidly developing areas of astronomy, the detection of gravitational waves. So LIGO has now, since the first detection, detected many hundreds of black holes through the gravitational wave signal. But it's still a mystery how these sources form. We don't know whether they form through just pairs of isolated binaries that happen to just be bound together and living in the field of the galaxies. We don't know if they might form in globular clusters. Um, as I'll talk about on the next couple of slides, I think there's a lot of evidence that some fraction, maybe even a large fraction of the LIGO sources that have been detected, including potentially this first one, were formed in a globular cluster. So as I said, there have now been hundreds of detections of, of black hole mergers by the LIGO uh, collaboration. Um, so this right here is showing basically all of the gravitational wave events that LIGO has observed um, in units of solar masses, which is basically how massive these, are, these objects are compared to the mass of the sun. So you can see the vast majority of these objects are the black holes. And then there's also a small handful of neutron stars that have also been detected pairs of neutron stars that merge together and also emit bursts of gravitational waves. So I'm not going to talk about those. We don't have enough time. The vast majority of the things are black hole mergers. And the one thing I do want to point out is this small group of really massive black hole mergers. These are things with masses of roughly 50 times to 100 times the mass of the sun. And these massive black hole mergers, there's been maybe half a dozen or so of these detected by LIGO, are really interesting and really mysterious because we did not think prior to LIGO that black holes of this mass should even exist. Based on uh, theoretical models of stellar evolution and massive star evolution, we thought that the most massive black hole you should be able to form through the evolution of a star was roughly 40 to maybe 50 solar masses. So these really massive black holes have basically made a career for people like me because now we have to explain how they're actually forming. So, one way we think they could potentially form is in one of these dense environments like a globular cluster, you can have a single black hole merger, form, you form a binary dynamically like I was showing on the previous visual. Those two things merge. So for instance, you have a 40 solar mass and a 40 solar mass black hole merge, you create an 80 solar mass black hole. Well, this object is still living in a globular cluster, so it can potentially find a new companion. It can find another black hole to merge with again a second time. And this allows you a way through the successive merger of different black holes over time. You can build up these very massive black holes that we previously did not think necessarily would exist. So um, this next slide, which is sort of the most sciencey slide I'm going to show, is showing in green the a mass distribution of all the black holes that have been detected with LIGO. And in black, I'm showing the mass distribution of all of the black hole mergers that occur in a set of globular cluster simulations that I've developed. And as you can see, the black curve, the globular cluster models, pretty nicely match and pretty nicely reproduce the mass distribution that's observed by LIGO. So I think it's quite possible that a fraction, maybe even a large fraction, of the black holes that LIGO has detected through gravitational waves could have formed in dense environments like globular clusters. So there are, of course, many other really interesting and exotic sources in globular clusters that have been both proposed theoretically and also in many cases observed. Uh, but we're running out of time, so um, I will wrap up by just saying that the future of this field of globular cluster science is really bright and exciting. Just as an example, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, which of course just uh, sent out its first images this week, um, is going to be really great at observing really young, really distant globular clusters. So basically the younger versions, what the globular clusters in the Milky Way looked like billions of years ago. So this 
uh, these observations made by the Webb telescope are going to be really fantastic at constraining the initial conditions of the globular clusters at the time they were born. And of course, the field of gravitation wave astronomy is also booming. And over the next years and decades, there are going to be hundreds to thousands of more gravitational wave signals from merging black hole binaries. As we attain more signals, we'll get a better understanding of where these sources might form, potentially in globular clusters. So thanks again for coming tonight. Um, very happy to answer some questions if people have any. Okay, so is Cameron here? I'll just ask questions. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the first question is, how hard is it to detect um, black hole star binaries because of how crowded clusters are? So that is indeed a big problem. So uh, there's a few things that help us. So the first thing is that when you have a lot of black holes in the cluster, they essentially uh, dynamically heat the cluster. They impart a lot of energy into the stars of the cluster that basically cause the cluster to be more puffy, less dense. So we expect actually the least dense clusters in terms of the stellar profile are the ones that have the most compact black hole subsystems. So that actually helps a little bit. The ones where they have the most black holes are the least dense where this crowding is least important. Um, but it's still a challenge. And certainly um, it's not a given that we can observe, we can look for black holes in every type of cluster. So for example, this cluster NGC 3201 that has these black holes that have been observed is one of the nearer clusters to earth. So you sort of have to have at least with current instruments, um, somewhat special conditions to be able to hope to observe these. So the second question is whether you can observe planets uh, through a similar technique um, in clusters. So in principle, yes, crowding is also really challenging there. Um, and uh, there have been searches for, cluster, for planets in nearby clusters, but there have not been yet uh, a confirmed detection. And in my opinion, it's just a consequence of the fact that it's so hard to do because the, the, um, the influence of a planet on a star is much less prominent than the influence of a black hole on a star. So that it, it requires a much more um, uh, sensitive um, instrument. Uh, but there's no reason to think that there shouldn't be planets in clusters. We observe planets around nearly all stars in the, in the Milky Way. There should be planets in clusters, but we haven't detected any yet. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, so yes. So the neutron stars get kicked out for a, they do get kicked out, but it's for a slightly different reason. They get kicked out because of, um, uh, for reasons explained by the supernova explosion that set themselves that form them. This is simply a byproduct of the stellar evolution of neutron stars. It has nothing to do with the fact that they're in a cluster. So neutron stars in the Milky Way, also we observe them at really high uh, distances from the disk of the Milky Way, which sort of is how we infer the large kicks. So, um, Escape velocities of clusters are are pretty low because they're, you know, they have a million stars, but the Milky Way has hundred billion stars, so they're low mass compared to a typical galaxy. So if you give a neutron star a, a large kick, it's going to be easy to kick it out of a cluster. So um, I, I, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, yes. Thanks. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe we should talk about this more during the panel because I know Cameron and everybody else has thoughts on this. Yeah, essentially at, at this point, everybody who works in astronomy has to have fairly detailed knowledge of 
um, what you would call computational astronomy, because this is not only how, you know, we use computers to not only model things, but also to analyze the data we get from telescopes. So when I say I'm a computational astronomer, that's generally what people use to, to say people who are primarily modelers as opposed to observers. But we're all computational scientists for sure. Oh, okay, sounds good. So there was a there were a bunch of questions on the internet, but one of them was how often do we observe supernovae explosions in globular clusters relative to just the general field? Okay, so there has not yet been a con so there are many supernova explosions that have been observed, but to observe one in a globular cluster and to know it's in a globular cluster, it has to be fairly nearby because you need to not only observe the supernova, but you need to be able to observe its host cluster that it's living in. So there is, has not, basically that means it has to be in the nearby universe, not necessarily in the Milky Way, but pretty close. And the rate of supernova explosions in the very nearby universe is pretty low. There hasn't been one in the Milky Way for over a hundred years, several hundred years. Um, so there very likely are supernova explosions. There almost certainly are supernova ex explosions happening in young clusters. Uh, but there has not yet been a confirmed bona fide detection of a supernova that we know happened in a cluster just because of the fact that it's the rate is, is, is low. Um, yes. Yeah, that was a very simple cartoon. You're exactly right. Some mass gets lost, not a lot, maybe a, a you know, of order 10% or so, a few to 10% um, through the merger and the emission of gravitational waves, basically. You lose, you lose some mass, but roughly 40 plus 40 equals 80, roughly. <laughs> okay, um, yes. Quasars. Okay, so the question is if quasars can form from globular clusters. So quasars are essentially uh, really bright um, uh, signals that we expect are um, supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies that are accreting material um, surrounding gas nearby the black holes. So um, quasars are observed, as I said, at the centers of galaxies. And it's somewhat of an open question how these supermassive black holes that are the source of the quasars form. Um, there are some ideas that, um, you know, if you have one of these globular clusters out in the halo of a galaxy and the cluster in spirals into the center of its galaxy, um, it, it basically, as it in spirals, it brings all of its black holes with it. And you can imagine if you bring all these black holes to the center of the galaxy, the black holes all merge with each other and they create a more, more massive black hole. And now you're on your way to potentially forming a supermassive black hole, which could potentially be the seat of a quasar. So that's possible. It's something that some people have looked into, but it's not, it certainly is not something that's been confirmed yet. Okay. Please thank our speaker, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Kyle Freeman. Excellent. Okay, so uh, now is the part of the evening where we have two contemporaneous events. We'll have uh, a table set up here in about five minutes, consisting of uh, Kyle, myself, and two other members of the department to answer questions. Many of the questions that didn't get asked or didn't get answered, that people still had hands raised, we'll address those. So, so if you have additional questions for Kyle or again about JWST or other things, feel free to stick around and ask them. Um, we also have telescopes that have just been set up on the adjacent athletic field. So if you uh, direct yourselves out the front door and kind of loop around the building, there will be signs that direct you onto the field. So you can check those out. That'll be going until about 10 o'clock and we'll be going about until 10 o'clock here. So feel free to go back and forth between the two. The building will remain unlocked and you can come in. But um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. And hopefully you'll stick around for a bit more. And again, we'll do this again in a month and we'll have astronomy on tap in a month and yay astronomy. Thanks for coming.
Are we audible over the internet right now? We are now. All right, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Oh, no, I'll just, okay. Well, take, take a seat, Dr. Kramer, take a seat. Um, thanks for everybody for sticking around and thank you internet audience, not just you two gentlemen, but also the webcam that's in front of you. Um, so uh, this is the portion of the night where we do kind of a Q and A with all of you um, and the internet audience. And we'll just briefly give an introduction. Each of us is a member of the department. Some of us are graduate students, some of us are postdocs. Um, yeah, we're both of those things. And uh, so we'll just do a short introduction for each of us so you know what science we work on. Um, and then feel free to ask your questions and we'll try and address everybody's questions and what they have. Um, I'm Dr. Cameron Hummels. I am a, a senior postdoctoral researcher here. I've been here for a while and I work on uh, galaxy evolution. So as Kyle alluded to at the end, um, there are many of us who do computational modeling of different astrophysical systems. I primarily work on trying to model astrophysical systems involving how galaxies form and evolve galaxies like our own Milky Way. Um, and many of the galaxies that you may have seen with the, the James Webb Space Telescope images that came out in the last couple of days uh, showcase some really cool galactic systems. So trying to understand how those form over many, many long timescales. So just as an example, uh, the Earth orbits around the sun and it takes a year to make one full orbit. That's why a year is what it is here. Um, but our entire solar system consisting of the sun and the planets takes 250 million years to go around the center of the Milky Way. And thus, when we look at other galaxies and you compare an image that was taken today with one that was taken maybe 50 years ago or hundred years ago, it basically looks like the same image. So in order to really showcase how these things change, you need to be watching it for a long period of time. And we just haven't been around long enough to see them change substantially. So we rely on computer simulations where we can artificially speed up the time in those simulations to see how they change over time. So that's a lot of what, of what I work on. Kyle? I guess you talked a bit, but if you want to add anything to what you Okay, I, well, I talked for 30 minutes, so hopefully that's enough <laughs> to know what I do. Globular clusters and black holes and globular clusters is what I work on. Hi, I'm Kostov. Um, so I work on this things called uh, any kinds of cosmic explosions on the sky. So I, I specifically work on this uh, explosions called supernovae, which is as uh, Kyle talked about when very massive stars explode. Uh, they, uh, they basically they can can no longer support uh, the mass of the star, and it collapses and dies in a magnificent e explosion that kind of outshines like the entire galaxy. So basically, in a few seconds during the, those explosion, it releases more energy than the sun would in its like entire lifetime of ten billion years. Hello, my name is Yu Han. I'm a fourth year graduate student here. I work on observations of black holes. So they include both uh, galactic stellar mass black holes and newly formed black holes born in the supernovae explosions. And also um, black holes in the center of galaxies being awakened by a star disrupted by the black hole. So if a star gets too close to the black hole in the center of a galaxy, the tidal force will torn it apart and the part of the star will orbit around the black hole to get accreted. And this process is what we call a tidal disruption event. Uh, so by studying those tidal disruption events, we can learn things about the accretion onto the black holes. Um, yeah, that's mainly work I'm working on. Um, my name is Dee. Uh, I just finished my first year here at Caltech. Uh, I also work on galaxy evolution, um, so looking at how galaxies are made, how they grow, um, but I do it observationally. So I work with a radio instrument that Caltech built um, at the Owens Valley in California, and we are looking at hydrogen, um, which is basically the fuel that new stars are made of. Um, and it's really hard to see in sort of the wavelengths that you can see with your eyes. You need to go to much longer wavelengths to see it successfully. Um, so I'm looking at, uh, there's a period of time in the history of the universe where star formation was really, really bright. Um, and we know that stars were being made really fast. We don't know a lot about the gas, the fuel that was making those stars. Um, and so I'm doing, investigating that basically, trying to find out 
those stars are clearly being made, what are they being made from? Um, which is kind of very important in how galaxies are made. Excellent, thanks guys. Uh, so we open it up to, to all of you. Questions, Brian. Um, so my question, just following up on the presentation is about globular, globular clusters generally. And um, this may confuse, I guess, uh, time and distance, and I don't intend to do that. So I'll try to be careful, but you talked about one of the characteristics of globular clusters is that they're old, you know, 10 billion years, you said. So, so two questions. The first one is, you would, I would think that over that span of time with the, uh, so much, again, like chaos going on in these clusters and things being flung out left and right, that, th that these clusters would, would have dispersed over that time frame. So first of all, why don't they disperse? And then secondly, if they are by definition or characteristic of them is that they're old, does that mean that there's something else about the evolution of the universe that has prevented globular clusters from forming in, you know, shorter time frames like three billion years ago? Or do those questions make sense? Okay, those are all good questions. I think I know the answers to most of them. <laughs> um, okay, so. Yes, some globular clusters, okay, let me answer it first this way. Although globular clusters, globular clusters by definition are old, there are also many younger stellar clusters observed in the Milky Way and other nearby galaxies that were born very recently. So we expect that actually there are massive and dense star clusters being formed throughout the history of the universe. In fact, we expect that actually most star formation happens in clustered environments. So we expect that actually, as a result of this, um, you know, not necessarily all of those clusters that stars are born in are gonna survive to become globular clusters. A lot of them are gonna dissolve much earlier in their lifetimes, which is why like the sun is not in a cluster currently, but it could have been born in a cluster potentially. So the vast majority of clusters uh, that form do dissolve. Um, and there's a lot of evidence for this. So for example, there are a lot of, um, one of the other really exciting areas of astronomy now is the observation of uh, streams of stars that are expected to be formed through the tidal disruption of objects that basically leave a big stream of stars out in the galaxy that came from one of these tidal disruption events. So it's very likely that these streams are formed from the tidal disruption of uh, younger versions of globular clusters. So it's very possible that, for example, there's some estimates that are for every single cluster that has survived to the present day, t over 12 billion years, there were maybe 10 more that did not survive and were disrupted and then just basically their stars then become just the normal stars in the galaxy. Um, I think, and then your second question I answered first about younger clusters, which are, are indeed very well observed. So does that answer the question more or less? Great, um, okay. Um, the new photo of the James Webb, like we're, we're looking at uh, stars that have been there for like billions of years. Is there a way to like predict what they will like today? Like if we had a teleportation machine and transport there, and then we see what the how the how the stars are formed today. Or does that make sense? No. So the, just so I understand, so the question is. The pictures that were just revealed from the James Webb Space Telescope in this last week, what if those are obviously looking at things in the past? What if we were to have magically be able to transport ourselves right adjacent to that thing and see the light that was being given off today? How would that light look differently? Um, that's a great question. And that's one of the main reasons that the James Webb Space Telescope is, is doing its studies is because up until now, we've primarily been looking at stuff that's at present day that's nearby to see how some of these stellar populations are in kind of the present day universe. And we aren't able to, until James Webb and some other similar instruments, we aren't able to as well study these things in the past, these relics of the past and how they looked in the past. So part of your answer is we already know, we don't know the exact object like, 
this galaxy, like Stefan's Quartet, or Stefan's Quintet was one of the images that maybe you saw. If I were smart, I'd show us a, a, a slide of that right now, but I've got so many technical difficulties right now. Um, but you may have seen that image consisting of five different galaxies. And that's actually, that's not that far away in the, in the universe, that's reasonably close. But um, then, the, then there was the, the deep field kind of image that was much farther away. So we know, we know more with those galaxies, how their counterparts in the local universe look. Um, and for the most part, the general trend in galaxies from long ago to today is that galaxies were much more uh, energetic and kind of amorphous at, 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 at a younger, in the younger universe. It was denser, so there were more collisions taking place between those galaxies, just like uh, you know, collisions by cars in a really crowded intersection, whereas later in the day, maybe not as many people are driving, and so there aren't as many cars running into each other. Sorry, that's a really morbid example. But, but you, get, you get the kind of idea, right? So um, galaxies today look a little bit more, um, there, there's less interactions that's going on between them. And there are, um, the stellar populations that are there are, are older. They tend to be a little bit more red uh, because, oh goodness. Did you talk about this in your talk? Stellar populations being redder or anything like that? Oh, good, okay. That's probably, no, I don't really want to get into it, but. Um, a younger stellar population, a younger pack of stars that's born tends to be more representative of having some high mass stars and some low mass stars. And the high mass stars, because uh, they have a lot of mass there, they have a lot of gravitational potential energy that's forcing them together. So they get hotter and hotter things tend to be bluer. So, but those die off quickly in supernovae. And so as a stellar population ages, you essentially bias yourself because you get rid of the really massive ones because they blow up. And those are the ones that are bluer. And so you're more populated. If a stellar population ages, you have redder over time because you've, you've weeded out the blue hot ones because they blow up too quickly. Um, and so in the, in, the, in the nearby universe, you see more of these redder systems because at the high red shift, I'm sorry, trying not to use jargon. Um, in the distant universe, the younger universe, there's a lot more collisions and there's a lot more star formation. And so you have a lot more of these more massive stars. So that's one of the ways it's different, but there are lots of ways it's different and we don't understand all of them yet. And so that's one of the big reasons that James Webb was, was created to, to study the, the distant younger universe. You guys wanna add on that? Sorry, that was just like a scramble of crap, but that's okay. Um, yes, gentlemen, sir. And the ones that are these clusters that are high red shifted versus the ones in our Milky Way, is the composition different? The metallicity, the the uh, the uh, you know uh, the type of planets that would form around these uh, stars. How are they different between the ones we see in the early uh, universe and here? And also, uh, does the uh, binary uh, black hole merger rates change based upon the composition uh, of these clusters? Is it is it something that we can uh, see or, or uh, get a reading from to tell us something about these clusters at a distance. Thanks. Do you want to handle this? I can answer. Does anybody else want to answer? Or I, I can. Okay. Um, so let's talk about. Okay. So in the Milky Way, there are very old pop old clusters. So they were formed a long time ago but they survived and what we see today is an old cluster. So because they formed a very long time ago, they uh, basically, uh, earlier on in the universe, there were less metals. Later on in the universe, there are more metals because the massive stars evolved and they spewed out their elements and then star formation happened again. So when these clusters in the Milky Way were born, you know, 10 billion years ago, they were lower metallicity. So at present, they are also very low metallicity populations. In fact, of all the stars in the Milky Way, the globular clusters are generally the lowest metallicity populations of stars, just because they were born so long ago. If we look at the analogs of globular clusters, which are the young massive clusters in the local, like in the Milky Way or in nearby galaxies that are just younger versions, they're still clusters, they're still dense, but they're younger. Those are higher metallicity because they were born more recently. Um, so hopefully that answers the, that, the metallicity age question. 
Okay, so the next question is about the effect on the black holes. So um, really massive stars as they evolve lose mass through stellar winds. And the expectation is that at higher metallicities, so stars born more recently, they lose more mass through winds. So this means that stars that were born in older clusters that were born with lower metallicities, the mass of stars uh, lost less mass. And when the stars lose less mass as they evolve, that means there's more mass to collapse into a black hole. So we expect that the oldest clusters, the ones that were born a long time ago, are able to form the most massive black holes. And the clusters more born more recently, and by the way, everything I'm saying here applies to clusters and also non-clusters. This is just star formation in general. The stars born more recently in higher metallicity populations, we expect are generally lower mass because of the fact that the winds blow out um, more of the stellar material. Good questions. Yeah, hopefully that helps. One second. There's a question. Uh, there are a bunch of questions on the internet, and they're going to have a, a mutiny if I don't ask one of them. So I'll, I'll get to you, you guys in just a second. So one of the questions that was asked online by user AC was, um, could a globular cluster, this structure that you defined over the course of your presentation, could it collapse under certain circumstances to form like a supermassive black hole or an intermediate black black intermediate mass black hole like the ones that we find in the centers of our of galaxies like the Milky Way? I feel bad answering all the questions. Anybody else can jump in if they want to answer things. But uh, okay, I'm happy to. But okay, so um, clusters, the centers of clusters can indeed collapse sometimes. So. Um, very early on in the cluster's evolution, when there are a lot of massive stars, because it's such a dense environment, the massive stars occasionally can collide with each other. And occasionally they can collide in a runaway scenario where basically you have one collision, it produces some really big star, and now it's really big, so now it's easy to collide again, and then it just basically accelerates and you basically have a you know, huge number of collisions that leads to the formation of a really massive object, like thousands of solar mass star. So once you form one of these really big giants, it can collapse into a more massive black hole than you would form otherwise to just the evolution of a single star. So we expect this is, this is hypothesized or speculated to be one way you could form massive black holes in clusters through these runaway stellar collisions. This has not been confirmed yet. Um, it's a big hope of many people that we might observe some of these in the near future with gravitational wave instruments, but this has not been confirmed yet. Um, I think that answers it pretty much. Okay, we'll take some more questions from the audience before we delve back into the internet. Gentlemen's here, yes. Uh, so um, in the beginning of the universe when there was you know, only hydrogen and helium, um, I read on the internet like a short phrase that there could have been stars or uh, stars that's 10,000 mass of the sun. And I wonder if that's like, if that's something more than just, uh, I can see something on the internet. And if that's true, then how can that bypass the eating to the limit? Mm. You guys want to, th these are all star questions. Who wants to talk about Eddington limit and uh... Population three stars, anybody? I'll yap, but I'm not a specialist on pop three stars. Do you want to? Do you want? You're a star man. Okay. I want to hear from D. Yeah. You want to talk to? Him? Okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, so the question the the question referenced something called the Eddington limit, which is the the theoretical limit with which a star can accrete, can like have stuff fall onto it and cause it to grow. Because at some level you can imagine that stuff would fall so fast onto, uh, onto a, a, a nascent star, like a, a baby star, that you wouldn't be able to allow more stuff to fall on because um, for a few reasons. One, there's only so much volume that it's falling into. Kind of like uh, when you, when you pull the cork out of a, of, a, of a sink, it doesn't empty itself immediately, right? 
there's a finite rate at which stuff can fall down through that, that the sinkhole in your sink and exit out the sink. Part of it is because of viscous effects of the fluid. Part of it is because of the cross section of the hole that allows it through. Part of it is because the radiation that's coming out from the star itself is kind of blocking that. And it's causing like a turbulent, uh, turbulent flow to, to, to cause problems. So that's, does that roughly describe the Eddington limit? So um, Sir Arthur Eddington was the first person to basically identify this in the 1920s, 1930s. I don't know, my history is a little edgy, but um, yeah. So uh, the, the question was primarily about that in the very early universe, when there weren't yet heavier elements than just hydrogen and helium that had formed during the Big Bang, um, if you could form more massive stars at that point. And yes, many of the computational models, th this has not been con confirmed with telescopes uh, because those stars that formed are, are so early in the universe that they're very, very far away from us. And we haven't yet in, uh, produced telescopes that are sensitive enough to see things that, that are that far on the other side of the universe. But computational models that try to produce those stars in the computer simulation seem to suggest that these would be rather massive, much more massive than the typical stars that we have in our neighborhood um, on the order of hundreds or even thousands of times the mass of the sun. Um, these are generally in the literature known as population three stars for reasons that aren't important. Um, but, but yeah, these are the first stars. It's thought, I don't think it's necessarily thought that the James Webb Space Telescope, despite its incredible power, uh, light collecting ability, as well as the sensitivity and, and efficiency of the instruments. I don't think it's predicted to actually be able to see pop three stars because I think population three stars are like redshift 12 to 15, which is to say farther away than the things that we can see in the universe. It might take another generation of stars to, or another generation of telescopes to be able to see, but we've had surprises before. so. Um, there was another related question on the internet that was about uh, this generation of stars that would James Webb be able to differentiate between the stars that are around us and these early stars. And it is possible if it's able to see these stars to maybe differentiate the way in which it would do that is by taking a spectrum of the light that comes from these stars. So rather than just taking a picture, which is all fine and good, um, collecting the light and breaking it into the different wavelengths of light, the different colors. And when you can, when you can see this spectrum that's produced, the, the different colors that are present in the light that's coming to us, you can identify different chemical signatures of different metals or different um, elements that are present in that star. And these early stars, these population stars, these first, three, uh, first generation stars shouldn't have a lot of heavier elements present in them versus like the sun. If you take uh, if you take a prism or a, some sort of diffraction grating, which is just a fancy prism and hold it up to sunlight, it will break into many different um, colors and there will be bright bands and dark bands in the, that, that spectrum of light. And that's indicative of the different elements that are present in our sun. Those would not be present in these early generations of stars. So that would be one way to differentiate that. And now I've rambled forever. So does that address your question? Okay, sweet. Uh, Thank you. Uh, this is a basic question, but it, it keeps me up at night. So, uh, you know, when the James Webb telescope was being talked about, it said that it could like look uh, so far, so deep into the universe that I like can see what the Big Bang it like looked like. And, you know, we don't really know what's there. But um, my question is, how did we know like what direction to look? You know, any any information about like the structure of the universe is much appreciated, uh, but I don't know if that's a relevant question. But like, yeah, how did we, how did we know which way to point? Who wants to, who wants to talk about the directionality of the Big Bang? All right. So this is a question that, in order to answer, you kind of have to really internalize the fact that we are in a universe that is constantly expanding. Um, which like, I can just tell you that fact and it can, you can register it, but it's something that to actually picture in your head is really hard. Uh, and that's because we live life 
in three dimensions, four if you count time. Um, but any sort of thing you can picture has to be stuck inside of those three dimensions. So like the, the analogy people always use to talk about the expanding universe is a balloon that's blowing up. Um, but the issue with that is you're not standing outside of the balloon looking at it blow up. You are actually embedded on the surface of that balloon watching it blow up. I promise this is all relevant. Uh, and so instead of just like having something that happened over there and like your balloon's blowing up over there, but you're standing here and looking at it, you are on that balloon the whole time. And so it's expanding around us essentially. So if you picture yourself on a surface of a balloon, it starts really small and it blows up. Um, everything around you is was stuff that started right beside you essentially. And so the Big Bang, it contained the whole universe uh, and then it expanded. Um, and so the Big Bang is kind of all around us essentially. So that's the answer ultimately to the question, uh, long-winded, but yeah, you don't really have to point in any specific direction. It's going on around you all the time. And then I think the other thing um, was, you talked about James Webb in particular. Um, I think someone else can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think James Webb, the Big Bang itself isn't necessarily one of the science goals. It's definitely the closest that we will be able to confidently observe to the Big Bang, um, but it won't be really focusing on the Big Bang. It'll be focusing on much younger galaxies than the one that any of the instruments before James Webb could look at. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the question was the balloon analogy. Um, why wouldn't we be in the middle of the balloon? Why would we be on the surface of the balloon? Uh, and that's kind of the central issue with the balloon analogy, unfortunately, is because the balloon analogy only works if the whole universe is two dimensional. You can only move around on the surface of the balloon because it's the universe itself that it, that's expanding. So it's the balloon itself that's expanding. And so that's sort of one of those things that's really takes some work to picture. Uh, it's not intuitive at all. Um, it would be like if you were like a picture on the surface of the balloon and the balloon is expanding, not you can't access any of the other areas around the surface of the balloon alone. Uh, and that's what makes it so hard to picture the expansion of the universe. And that's why the balloon analogy is kind of not necessarily ideal, but we don't really have anything better unless anyone does. I really like the blueberry muffin analogy. So, plus, I really like blue or, or chocolate chip muffin, something like that. So the idea is basically it's more of a three dimensional structure as opposed to the two dimensional one, which the balloon is a very common, common uh, analogy, but it is. But you're, she's just talking about the the surface of that balloon and how it expands and how any location on the surface expands and we're not talking at all about the interior or the exterior of the balloon that's why it's a little bit counterintuitive it, it's a little confusing so i'll replace that with the blueberry muffin idea and that is if you're making you know a blueberry muffin in the oven you you put down your dough you put your individual blueberries in that and each of those blueberries represents a galaxy or a star or some point in that three-dimensional universe and then as the yeast leavens and rises and everything starts to go up each blueberry appears to move for outward from every other blueberry in that space and so in that case, yes, there is a center of the blueberry muffin, but imagine an infinite blueberry muffin uh, dough. I know it's a wonderful image, isn't it? But um, in, that, in that world, and that's effectively the world that we think that we live in potentially, we don't know if it's infinite in extent or finite in extent, but we do know that the, the 
the observable edge of the universe is finite because there's a finite time. So we can only reach the edge of our, our knowledge of the space around us because time has only been long enough to allow information to travel to us from that edge. But, but it could, formally speaking, go on to infinite. So we can imagine this infinite distribution of dough and blueberries everywhere. And from every location, the farther away something is over time, the farther it will expand outward from your location. And that's true of any blueberry in that distribution. The, the rest of the blueberries will appear to be flung outward from you it's based on the, the presence of this expanding blueberry universe. Does that help clear up some of the, the counterintuitive? <laughs> that's fair. That's fair, that's fair. Um, additional questions, sir? Yeah. Um, in, regard, in regards to gravitational wave astronomy, um, there's like a lot of different hypothesized reliable sources for um, like neutron star and black hole wave generation. So I was wondering if those um, binary black hole mergers that are so common in globular clusters will become like the most reliable sources for those wave generations since they contain so many neutron stars and black hole merger events. Excellent question. Gravitational wave, globular clusters, who wants to who wants to address this? Hmm? No, anybody else. Okay, so Let's see where to start. Okay, so uh, first of all, of all the different types of source, so currently there are three types of sources that have been observed by LIGO. There are pairs of black holes, where both object is a black hole, pairs of neutron stars, where they're both a neutron star, and also ones where one is a black hole and one's a neutron star. So in theory, LIGO could also potentially detect uh, the signature from a core collapse supernova, but it hasn't been detected yet. So those are the three that have been observed so far. And going in, we thought those were gonna be the main things that LIGO would observe. Um, so of those, the most common is a binary neutron star merger. That happens at the, high, at the highest rate in the local universe. Now, just because it happens at the highest rate doesn't mean it is gonna be the highest detection rate. Because as you could probably imagine, a neutron star is being less massive than black holes. When they merge, their gravitational wave signature is a little bit reduced. It's not quite as prominent as a black hole merger. So even though there are more binary neutron star mergers occurring, you can't detect them as distant as you can a black hole merger. So because you can detect the black hole mergers so for much further away, overall, LIGO has detected many more black hole mergers. And that will probably be the case moving forward. Black hole mergers will be the most um, the, the the most common detection from LIGO, and then black hole um, black hole neutron star mergers are uh, going to be the least common for sure detected by LIGO, just because they are not as formed at as high of a rate as the binary neutron star systems, um, and they also can't be observed as far as the black hole black hole systems. Um, okay, so in terms of the cluster formation scenario. So I hinted at this a little bit um, as some, in one of my slides. So the black holes sink to the center of the cluster and they form black hole binaries through the interactions of the black holes with each other. So we expect that globular clusters are really good at forming pairs of black holes that merge. And you remember, I also said the neutron stars because they're lower mass, they don't really sink like the black holes. So the densest part of the cluster is the center. So because the black holes sink, they're living in the densest part. That's perfect for forming lots of, lots of binaries and lots of mergers. The neutron stars are hanging out in the outer parts of the cluster that are as dense. So they never experience as many encounters as the black holes. So they don't form binaries in globular clusters as often. So we expect that the binary neutron star mergers that are occurring, like the ones that have been detected by LIGO, are not formed in clusters. They're formed from just pairs of stars that happen to be bound together in the Milky Way galaxy or in other galaxies in any sort of typical galaxy. And then basically through the evolution of that binary, the, bi the neutron stars form, and then they eventually are close enough together to mer in spiral and merge. Um, I think that answered everything. Was there something I missed or does that help? Okay, good. Um, yeah, let's do. So if you observe the globular clusters in radio, instead of like, in, yeah, like radio waves, would we expect something different about those? Like, what would we expect to see? 
Anybody want to talk about radio astronomy? Yeah. Uh, so in radio, we typically see um, what we call synchrotron emission. Those are very high energy electrons being accelerated. And in the presence of high magnetic field, the electrons will gyro around the magnetic field and we see the emission peaking the radio band. Um, in globular clusters, uh, at least I think it's a little hard to generate such high energy population of high energy electrons uh, because in order to generate those, you typically either need a very um, energetic jets being generated or some accretion going on. Um, yeah, do I understand this correctly? Yeah, so the only one exception that, that uh, the, the one radio source that um, people have talked a lot about in clusters is, is millisecond pulsars. So those are just rapidly rotating, highly magnetized neutron stars that emit these pulses. Um, and they're, we yeah, have once every millisecond, um, so extremely fast rate of um, pulsations. So there have been many of these observed in globular clusters. Um, so that's that's sort of the one thing that comes to my mind for what radio instruments might see in clusters. Just like adding a fun fact, this millisecond pulsars rotate faster than the mixture grinders that we use in our kitchen. And those are almost the mass of the sun. So you can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna get some more questions before I come back to you, Brian. So I guess uh, circling back to like the Big Bang and the, and the universe expanding. Um, so that I'm, I'm like, am I expanding right now with the space, or is it like a more between between me and Brian over here expanding, or like are we ourselves expanding it? We don't notice it because everything else is. It looks fine. This is an excellent question. Um, so how much, on what space scales is the universe actually expanding? Is it on the molecular scale? Is it on the person size scale? Is it on only the galaxy size scale? It's happening everywhere. Um, it's just the small amount that's happening on local scales, our body's able to compensate. Or uh, for instance, our galaxy is expanding because the space itself is expanding, but gravity is able to counteract that and continue to contract to hold it in that size scale. Whereas when things are not gravitationally bound together, the space in between them is able to expand so much that, that they, they actually get farther apart. So at least in the present universe, gravity and it can compensate and collapse as much as the universe is expanding, but um, but I don't know if that will always be true. I mean, people talk about the big rip, which is where this expansion is accelerating. We discovered this in the last 20 years or so. Uh, and, 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 and so that expansion is getting faster and faster. And at some point there is the concern, and I don't know what the, the general conclusion is here about the fate of the universe, but people talk about something called the big rip where in fact, molecules will get ripped apart. Atoms will get ripped apart because of this, the acceleration of the expansion of the, the space itself will occur so quickly on even small scales. But don't worry, today you're fine. Tomorrow you're gonna be fine. Probably the next day you'll be fine. But um, in you know many times the age of the universe in the future, I may not be able to say that with so much certainty. You guys wanna add on that? Uh, in terms of scales, for example, even in the, uh, as far as scales in terms of solar system size is concerned, say the planets and the moon, uh, the expansion does not matter at all. Also in terms of size of a galaxy, the size does not matter at all. Like the, the, the expansion of the dark energy, what's it called? It doesn't matter at all. So only in scales of what we call 100 megaparsecs, which you can visualize as something like a million times the distance between the sun and the nearest sun. Only in those distance scales does it like, as of present day, the dark energy start dominating over gravity. And then you'll find that uh, two galaxies like placed 100 megaparsecs away would be necessarily expanding away from each other. 
uh, would be basically going away from each other because the space is uh, moving away from each other. But less than that, uh, it does not matter. For example, the nearest galaxy that we have called the Andromeda galaxy, it's actually moving towards us because yeah, their gravity is dominating over the dark energy. Also, as far as big group is concerned, yeah, I think like we are in a lucky time. If, if we were here, like say a few billion years later, even if we put out like James wave, it would be able to see nothing because light would, like right now, light takes like 13, six or like some few billion years to reach us. But after a few billion years, it would take like trillions and trillions of years to reach us. So we'd be seeing just darkness. Yeah. Being more optimistic. Yeah. 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 That's good. I like the optimism. Uh, sure. Hi, uh, thanks for answering all of our questions. I, so in your presentation, um, you mentioned there's like about 150 globular clusters that we observe in the Milky Way and potentially like maybe 50 more that we're not certain of. So I was just wondering if there's any research being done on this so that we can say with certainty how many there are in the Milky Way and then whether or not maybe like James Webb could possibly aid in this. Anybody want to answer or should I answer? Okay. Um, okay. So basically the idea is, so there's the very bright center of the galaxy, the bulge, which we know there's certainly a bunch of stars behind the bulge that it, the bulge is just blocking our view. And as roughly speaking, the, as far as we can observe the clusters, that we can observe are roughly spherically distributed. So there's no reason to think that there shouldn't be clusters hidden behind the bulge. There's not just going to be an absence of clusters there. So you can do a rough estimate of the fact that based on the current distribution of clusters, we can observe there should be some other clusters that, that are just hidden behind that bulge. There's no reason to think there are any, there's nothing particularly special about that part of the galaxy. It's just, we happen to be where we are with the bulge between us. So those clusters that are there, they're not, I don't think anything super exotic or strange. They're probably just a few extra clusters that are similar to the other clusters that we observe. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah. Yeah, so in order to identify those globular clusters, you need a very good angular resolution. Uh, the reason why we find so many global clusters in the Milky Way is that they are so nearby, so we can see them, see them individually. But in distant galaxies, the galaxy itself is just a small point on the image. So with GWST, we can find more of them because for space telescopes, how well we can resolve the source is depending on the wavelengths over the diameter of the, of the telescope. So James Webb is operating in a slightly longer wavelength than HST, than the Hubble Space Telescope. But the diameter is also much larger. It's a six, six meter, 6.5. So we can resolve sources much better than any other telescopes in the world. Uh, for ground-based telescopes, because of the atmosphere, the angular resolution is just, um, uh, you can't do very well because the atmosphere is pretty turbulent. So yeah, I would say GBST is the probably the best telescope to find more of those globular clusters. Mm -hmm. I guess just in terms of picturing just how cool James Webb is um, in terms of this angular resolution we've been talking about. So a couple of like mental pictures is, so did everyone see that the first image they released, the big group of group of clusters? So that is basically, if you're looking at the sky, that whole image is about the size of a grain of rice that you're holding at arm's length. And then the smallest thing that James Webb is capable of resolving uh, is about 0.1 arc seconds. And that probably doesn't mean much to you if you're not an astronomer. Uh, so that is about the size of a penny um, seen from here. If someone was holding it up standing in downtown LA so it's it's crazy the scales we're talking about like this is really a lot of work has been done to get here uh next question awesome i'm going to try and ask some of the myriad questions that have been asked on the internet 
to the panel. Um, another globular cluster question. How do objects like neutron stars get kicked out of globular clusters, especially when a globular cluster is relatively young? All right, Mr. Doctor, globular cluster. So um, the reason is when a star, when a massive star explodes, uh, undergoes a supernova explosion, we, ex well, let me explain it this way first. So when we look at neutron stars in the Milky Way, they are observed with very high offsets and very high velocities relative to the disk of the Milky Way where we thought they would have formed. So from those, um, from that information that we observe for the neutron stars in our own galaxy, we infer that they must have received kicks at birth through some mechanism. So kicks of order a few hundred kilometers per second. So really large kicks. So we expect these kicks occur during the supernova explosion um, associated with the formation of the neutron stars. And we think the kick happens because basically the material that's ejected in the supernova is not ejected perfectly symmetrically. So um, you can imagine sort of if some fraction of the supernova, if the supernova explodes a little bit more in this direction, then it kicks the neutron star in the other way, just basically a momentum impulse. Um, and there are some simulations of supernova explosions that sort of uh, suggest these kicks might be occurring. So basically then we expect that the majority of neutron stars when they're born receive these large kicks, a few hundred kilometers per second. And when a cluster is born, because we know the mass of these clusters roughly, and we know their sizes, we know what the escape velocity of these clusters is. And the escape velocity, which is the velocity you need to exceed in order to escape the gravitational potential well of the environment, um, if the kick of these neutron stars is larger than the escape velocity, uh, then it should be kicked out. And the typical escape velocity of a typical cluster is maybe 100 kilometers, 50 to 100 kilometers per second, quite a bit less than the typical kicks that we infer based on observations of neutron stars. So based on this, based on the fact that we expect most neutron stars to get kicks at birth, and based on our best understanding of escape velocities of clusters at the time the neutron stars are born, we think most of them should be kicked out of the cluster at when they're born. Other, do we want to do another online question? Sorry, I'm just trying to catch up on all the questions that have been asked. One second, Brian. Um, there was an additional question online asking about the deep field image that was taken, that was the first image, you know, that Joe Biden had us waiting an hour and a half, and then he came online and showed us the new image. So that image that shows the, I, don't, I guess it's called the deep field. I don't know if that's actually going to be the JWST deep field, because it only looked at it for 12 hours, whereas like the Hubble deep field had... Well, I know, but presumably they're going to use director or discretionary time to stare at some field for like a week or two weeks, and then we'll really see some impressive stuff. But that is very impressive. But the question is, in that field, um, you could see a number of different galaxies. You could see some of these gravitational warps and lenses and so on and so forth. But someone pointed out that you could see um, little blobs in some of those galaxies, yellow dots. Can we resolve globular clusters in these distant galaxies has anyone i don't know i haven't looked deeply enough at these image but has anyone made any kind of claims that we can resolve the stellar populations in these galaxies that are you know megaparsecs away many hundreds of megaparsecs away uh, um not in those really distant galaxies those are way too far to be able to resolve a single cluster um but in other galaxies in the local universe, so for in instance, in M87, uh, which is about 16 megaparsecs away, we can resolve globular clusters. So in the local universe, there are you know, plenty of galaxies that we can resolve individual clusters. We obviously can't observe them at the level of detail that we can the ones in the Milky Way, but we do have a pretty good amount of information on uh, extragalactic globular clusters. Okay. Uh... I'll come back to you, Brian. I know you've always got a question for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi. Um, I heard that um, black hole pulsar binaries are very rare. Is that true? And if that's true, why is that true? And um, is it for a similar reason than you were saying about the neutron stars getting kicked out? 
So that's my question. Excellent question. Are neutron star black hole binaries less frequent than we would expect them to be? E? You want to? No. You want to take this? Well, I mean, a lot of these questions are relative to your talk. All good. Um, okay, so you are asking specifically about pulsar plus black hole binaries. So um, there is not yet there. So there has been, you could say, one or a few black hole neutron star binaries observed from the LIGO detections. Um, there hasn't been a confirmed black hole plus neutron star binary from LIGO, but there's a few very likely candidates for black hole neutron star binary in spirals. Um, they're rare to begin with, black hole neutron star binaries. The reason why is because most stars in binaries are generally formed with roughly equal mass components. So you typically might have, say, a pair of stars that are both 50 solar masses that would both form black holes, or you might have a pair of stars that are both 10 solar masses that both form neutron stars. The stars that would form a black hole neutron star binary would have to be more asymmetric at birth, which exists, but they're rarer. So we expect to begin with black hole plus neutron star binaries are, are more rare. And then uh, only a, then a fraction of neutron stars are then going to be observed as pulsars. Um, and I say observed as pulsars because pulsars are born with very high magnetic fields that decay. Um, so a pulsar is only actually observable as a pulsar for a finite length of time. And then it becomes a, basically a dead pulsar that would not be observable with radio instruments. So you have to get pretty lucky to find a black hole plus pulsar or a black hole plus millisecond pulsar binary. Um, but that would be, that's sort of like uh, people who work in pulsar astronomy. That's like the dream system to find. It's not totally out of the question to find one. You just would have to get a little lucky. It, I think it's very, very plausible that people might observe such a system within the next maybe decade or something, but that present no, system has not yet been found. I do have something to add after all. Uh, I guess just for clarification, um, people are nodding along with a lot of confidence, but um, pulsars are neutron stars. I don't know if, how clear we've been about that, but yes, that, that's the case. So um, yeah. Sorry, now I'm yawning, but it's hidden behind my mask, so. Yeah, what is the stellar density of a globular cluster? And if you uh, put us in one of those, are we going to survive? Put, our, put, the, put the sun, earth, our solar system, everything. Can we survive? Are we going to live? Are we going to die? Dark, dark futures. Dark futures. What, huh? Oh, absolutely. When you look up at an image of like of a globular cluster, it's, yeah, it's incredibly bright. Oh, as if you were looking from a planet into, uh, okay. I'll take it. Okay. Um, okay. The typical density. So you can just do a really rough estimate. Typically a cluster has about a hundred thousand or a million stars. And the typical size is about a parsec or maybe more like two parsecs. So a million divided by two cubed is basically about 10 to the five. Parsec is um, three, it's three light years, or also I think a more useful thing, it's the distance from us to the closest star. So um, yeah, this is something I, I said um, earlier is that this sort of shows you how dense clusters are. Instead of only having two stars within a parsec, like the sun is, clusters have you know hundreds of thousands of millions of stars. So. Roughly 100,000 to a million stars per cubic parsec is the, is the density answer. So really dense. So if the, if the Earth was orbiting a star in the cluster, uh, it depends where it would be in the cluster. So if it, was out in, if it was orbiting one of the stars out in the outer parts of the cluster where the cluster is less dense, I don't think there's any reason to think it couldn't survive and you couldn't form a habitable planet and humans couldn't survive there. The night sky would look very different because there's so many more stars nearby, it'd be much brighter. But um, if it was out in the outer parts of the cluster where it's less dense, it's not necessarily going to collide with another star and be destroyed or anything. But if the planet was orbiting a star in the center of the cluster, which is much denser, 
then the star would be more likely to undergo um, a flyby encounter with another nearby star. And in that case, um, there's a very good chance the planet would then be ripped apart from its host star. And then the planet might form, it might become bound to a different star or it might be flung out and just be a free floating planet in the cluster. Um, so that would be really hard to potentially be living on. Um, but yeah, hopefully that answers it, I think. I have something to add on to that and actually start a conversation here. Um, so a lot of a lot of the turmoil that's here on the Earth or in the inner solar system often is related to the infall of comets from the outer part of our solar system. And we think that a lot of times the, the thing that triggers a comet infalling into the inner solar system is some sort of inner gravitational interaction with a passing star that may only be, you know, a couple parsecs away, a couple light years away that triggers this. It may just also be interactions between the objects in the outer part of the solar system, either in the Kuiper belt or the Oort cloud. But is it possible that anywhere in a globular cluster is much more dense than it is here? And so you'd have more gravitational interactions, which wouldn't necessarily yield this doomsday scenario of ripping the planet apart, but could trigger some sort of infall of a comet or something that would have implications for us when these things come inside and slam into us like Deep Impact or Armageddon or choose your favorite disaster movie about something striking the earth. Do you think that could happen even if it were in the outskirts of a globular cluster, the solar system? I think it certainly must be the case that any, anything that's happening in our solar system that's caused by interactions with nearby stars, that the rate of those events is certainly gonna be amplified in a cluster, no matter where you are in the cluster. So. I don't think there's any reason to suppose that there couldn't be planets in a cluster orbiting stars with their own Oort cloud and comets and stuff. And I think inevitably there must be more collisions and interactions with those comets. So I think, yeah, definitely I think it would be much harder to have a planet harboring life, I think in a cluster because of all these things that could go wrong and interrupt the story basically. Yeah, just to make it like debatable and exciting, I would say. <laughs> I would say it won't harm because like uh, I think based on uh, the density that you say like a million per parsec cube so it's like so right now the uh, right now the comets that we have are at a distance of say I don't know beyond Pluto so like around 100 AUs which is still like 10 to the power minus 4 parsecs so I think the nearest star even in this case would be quite far away from that so yeah Yeah. Uh, yeah. One reason could be that. And the second could be like, I don't know, it might, uh, in spite of like, it would rather help instead of harming because it would just uh, absorb all the small rocks. Uh, because like the way Jupiter is protecting the earth, uh, in spite of being like a comparatively much smaller object. So I think if, it, if there's a star nearby, then it would like definitely take away all the blows. Yeah. You're here to hear it first people. No one knows if it's better or worse to live in a globular cluster, but um, any additional questions as we finish up our evening? Yes. Thanks for joining us. So I have two questions. Um, first is, I'm not sure if you uh, explained how clusters form entirely. And then the second one is also the one that keeps me up at night. Um, so the universe is expanding. Do we have an idea what it ex what is, is expanding into? Because that one does keep me up a lot. Two questions. How do they form? You gave a whole talk on them. How do globular clusters form? Anybody else? Kauso. Uh, do you want to take it? No, go ahead. Um, so the way stars form is that basically you have a big region of gas dust. And then when there's some kind of disturbance, all the dust and gas would collapse and form a big ball of gas, like, like for example, the sun. But the way we define a star is that uh, it has to be dense enough that it starts fusing hydrogen to helium inside the core. So basically when the gas collapses and then the density and temperature of the core increases, it has to reach a certain critical value after which the star basically becomes an engine. 
uh, it, it would stop a further collapse because of this uh, nuclear fusion that's going on inside. So the reason the sun is stable right now is because even though gravity is pulling it inward, uh, there's this nuclear fusion going on at its core, which is kind of radiating out energy, which is balancing the gravity. So the way stars form is basically they have this big dust, uh, big uh, things called molecular clouds, or there are this lots of dust and lots of gas, and they like uh, they start collapsing. And what happens is that first, for example, if you have a big cloud, you first collapse as one object. That's one possibility, and you could form like one big star. Instead of that, you could also fragment. So that big ball of gas could fragment into thousand pieces. And now instead of one star, you'll be having thousand stars. So basically for all these clusters, uh, you have a big ball of gas, which fragments and like kind of forms uh, thousands and thousands of stars at the same time. So uh, we also, th that's the reason that we assume that all the stars in a cluster are kind of near, nearly the same age as well, because they formed at the same time from the same cloud. Oh, that, that keeps me awake at night as well. <laughs> well, I know the answer, but I don't know how to. Uh, I mean, it's something which is not intuitive. Uh, the reason is that there's nothing to expand into. When we say space time, uh, we mean everything that there is. So for example, a similar question is also when the Big Bang happened. Uh, a question that I get is like, where was it initially? Like, where did it explode into? Uh, the answer like for that as well is that the very beginning of space time happened at that moment. And uh, there is nothing called outside. I think the reason we believe, I, I like this example of, uh, so basically there's an end in a very linear rod. And for it, like the whole world is this 1D, plane and it can't perceive what the second dimension is right so uh, it's kind of similar for us we live in a three-dimension world and anything that's like higher dimension when we include space time is not possible to intuitively imagine uh, a lot of it is like mathematical um, so when we say space time we mean that it started at t equal to zero it, like it didn't expand into something it was the creation of space time itself and that itself is expanding there's nothing gone outside. That's how I, I think. Yeah. Oh no, I don't have a better answer. It's not a great answer. I mean, Kostov did an excellent job responding, but it doesn't give you the like umph that you want. Like, oh, uh, uh, yeah, it's it's frustrating. Yeah, the mathematical formalism is there to explain it, and it makes sense in terms of the mathematics, but we just don't. We aren't good at perceiving dimensions greater than three, and so it's it's not very. I think it just has to be taken mathematically. We can't imagine beyond that. Brian, uh, in light of the the blueberry muffin analogy, and then we were talking about the croissant shaped heliosphere theory. You, maybe you need to come up with a, another pastry analogy for what the universe is expanding into, because that seems to be a theme. Oh, and also speaking of that. To this gentleman's question about the expansion on a small scale, I'm, I'm actually publishing a data set next month in PLS1, um, which is that I weigh the same thing this morning to the 10th of a pound that I did on Sunday. So that definitively proves there's no expansion on a smaller scale. Serious question, serious question. Um, how do we trace a gravitational wave that's detected by LIGO back to a specific event? How do you know that it's two neutron stars or two black holes or what the size of those objects is? How do they, how do they determine that? Who wants to gravitational wave it up? You, Hon? I think so for most of the LIGO detections, we don't know exactly where they come from. Uh, because LIGO, they have uh, some arms and they can, they can uh, jointly localize with the European Virgo uh, mission. So taken together, they can localize sources to like a few hundred square degrees, which is still a pretty large patch on the sky. Uh, for double neutron stars, um, we have some hope 
in the sense that we can expect the electromagnetic emission to appear. So we see in the LIGO uh, localization region, we use telescope to search for electromagnetic counterparts. And in that way, um, we can see if there's any new sources on the sky that's consistent with the LIGO uh, region, and we can uh, find a source in this way. And we have done this in one case uh, in 2017 for one nearby double neutron star merger. Uh, but for the majority of neutron star black holes and uh, binary black hole mergers, I don't, um, so there's no uh, confirmed uh, electromagnetic counterparts and we don't know exactly which galaxy they come from. Yeah, this is from the gravitational wave signal. We can infer the masses of the two merger components and the spin parameter and roughly the distance, but we don't know exactly where on the sky, which galaxy they come from. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, you can't detect the spin. You can just uh, what you can basically detect is the pattern of the wave, and then there are this uh, general relativity models which people use to compute if what would happen if two such black holes were to merge, and then there are these parameters like total mass of both the black holes, and then the spin parameters. So you basically try to simulate these collisions and see which matches with the one we observed. So if I have a signal and I did a simulation with like 50 mass, 50 solar mass black hole with a 30 solar mass black hole and the signal exactly matches to what we observed, that's how we can say that uh, this is what it must have been. Also like when two black holes merge, uh, there's no way to know, like detect through any other telescope because it's like two black holes. So the reason it's black is that it doesn't emit anything. So it like never know exactly what it was by following it up with other telescope. Uh, yeah, but we have just a rough guess of where it could be. And, uh, what the mass is good. All right. It's 10 o'clock. Thank you all for sticking around and coming up with so many great questions. This is really excellent. Um, thank you, online audience, for sticking with us through, through this whole endeavor. And um, remember, we will have these events happening monthly. Our next one will be um, August 5th will be the next stargazing lecture. So just a few weeks from tonight. Um, and then our next astronomy on tap will be August 15th at the uh, dog house in Old Town, Pasadena. And yeah, thanks everybody for coming. We'll, we'll see you next month. And thank you to our excellent panelists and speaker tonight.